So today we're continuing in our, our series looking at the book of Acts. And today we're looking at Paul's second missionary journey. So that's a journey across modern day Turkey and Greece. It's also the first time that we see Paul preach on European soil. So if we look in chapters 16 through to 18 in the book of Acts, we'll notice that Paul has a pattern to his ministry. He arrives in a city and then he looks for the Jewish place of prayer or the, or the synagogue, if the town or city has one. And many of the events that happen in this section happen on the Sabbath day, on the Saturday, because that's when the Jews are at their synagogues. And in Acts 16, uh, verse 13, we read, On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the side of the river where we thought there would be a place of prayer. And whilst on other occasions we read Acts 17, 2 to 4, Paul went to the Jews in the synagogue as he customarily did and on three Sabbath days he addressed them from the scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead saying this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large group of the God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So Paul's mission strategy as it were is quite simple on saturday go to synagogue which he was doing anyway because he's a jew and try and persuade the jews there that jesus is the messiah and he would adjust not just the jews but also the god-fearing greeks so that's non-jews who already worship the god of israel and attend synagogue but who had not officially converted to judaism okay and it's thought that christians or Jewish Christians continued to gather together with other Jews in synagogues for at least 300 years, probably, possibly more, until, you know, Roman religion became Christianity and things got separated out a little bit. Um, so it would appear that the majority of new converts were already worshippers of the God of Israel. All Paul was doing was encouraging them to accept that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. So Paul wanted to tell the Jews and the god that the same one who had led Israel out of Egypt, the one who had walked with Adam in the garden, the one who had met with Abraham and wrestled Jacob, had been born of a virgin of David's line, and that he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, to liberate us from the power of sin and death and hell, that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and rose again on the third day, in order, and he appeared to many people to prove that he had indeed been raised from the dead. And now he's seated at the place of God's right hand, enthroned as king and Messiah over the world. And he will come again to set the world to right. So at the beginning of uh, his journey, Paul and Barnabas fell out um, over John Mark. So we're told in Acts 15, uh, 38 to 41, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia. And had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas as he left the believers entrusted to him the Lord's gracious care. Then he travelled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. So um, Barnabas and Mark retrace the, the first mission, as it were, and check up on the new believers, see how they're all doing whilst Paul and Silas head north towards Turkey. And we're told that in the middle of Turkey, in, in Lystra, they meet Timothy. His mother is a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. And Paul here respects uh, both the Jerusalem council and the Jewishness of Timothy and has him circumcised for the sake of the Jews living among them uh, before he's allowed to join in on the missions trip. Uh, I'm sure many men today are very glad that that's not a condition today for joining in a missions trip, that they need to be circumcised in order to come along. And with Timothy, they travelled north through the very heart of Turkey until they arrived at Troas, the land of the ancient city of Troy, the one with the horse, you know, on the edge of the Aegean Sea. And we're told in Acts 16, 6 through to 7, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in the province of Asia. When they came to Mysia, or Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do this. 
So we can see here that Paul, Silas and Timothy feel all the time that they're being led and directed on their mission by the Holy Spirit. And then they arrive in Troas and the narrative changes. It goes from a they to a we. And so we can see or at least assume that here Luke, the author of the narrative, has joined them in Troas because he was saying they. Now he says we. And so here also Paul has a vision at the night and it's not of Helen of Troy or uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon and Achilles and a thousand ships and the fall of Troy. No, he sees rather a man from Macedonia, the home of Alexander the Great, uh, calling him over across the Aegean. And so they set sail across the Aegean and they arrive on the shores of modern day Greece. And they travel inland until they arrive at Philippi, named after the father of Alexander. The city was home to military veterans and featured many temples dedicated to the Greek gods and to the, the gods of Egypt. And we read in Acts 16, 13 and 15. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the side of a river where we thought there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began to speak to the women who had assembled there. A woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thritera. And a God-fearing woman listened to us, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptised, she urged us, If you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house. And she persuaded us. So here we see Paul finding how, where the Jews and the God-fearers are within the city. He learns that they're gathering outside the city at the river, and that's probably for easy access to water for purification rituals. And once there, Paul persuades one of the non-Jewish God-fearers that Jesus is the Messiah. And she, that's Lydia, invites them back to their house. And she's a seller of purple cloth, so she's probably very wealthy. It's also estimated that about 80% of God-fearers, so that again is non-Jews who worship the God of Israel, were women at this time. And so Lydia is Paul's first convert in Europe, and she was already a worshipper of the God of Israel. And friends, Paul had a very deliberate mission strategy. And what's your mission strategy? What? Well, who are the non-Christians around you that you're trying to influence for the kingdom? Family, friends, co-workers? Are you, like Paul, seeking to be led by the Spirit? And how are you witnessing for Jesus? In the next section, uh, Luke records that Paul and Silas are thrown into prison because Paul exercised a demon from a slave girl that had allowed her to foretell the future. Her owner saw this as basically an attack on his property rights. You can, he could no longer make money from this slave girl, and so they were hauled before the magistrate, beaten, and they're imprisoned. And in the Greek, Luke describes the demon as a, a python spirit, which is associated with the Greek god Apollo and with the oracle at Delphi. And the spirit in the girl, it referred to them as servants of the Most High. And this is the same title that the demons use uh, when Jesus encounters them. And they call Jesus Son of the Most High. And it's a title for God used in Deuteronomy 32 when we see that the Most High divided the nations among the angelic spirits and he chose Israel as his portion. And the slave girl has been exploited by her owner and by the spirit that possessed her. And Jesus liberates her through Paul from this bondage. And as Paul has arrived in this pagan area, it's worth talking about what sacrifices actually are. Imagine you're a hunter-gatherer tribe and you're walking through a forest and you encounter another group of humans. You have various options. You can attack them, you can take over them, or you could offer them food and hospitality and join together and keep the peace. And this is the very heart of sacrifice. If you come across a spirit in a certain place, you... You cannot kill them, but you can befriend them. And sacrifice is about not the killing, but the eating. It's about fellowshipping with spirits, getting them on your side to help with your issues. And so the main purpose of sacrifice is to offer hospitality to spirits through rituals, to keep them friendly, to keep them on your side. 
And what we're discovering through archaeology in places like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey and others is that the very first centers of human civilization are built around ritual sites, around places of pilgrimage for hunter gatherers. Historians used to think that it was civilization that started first, farming, and then cities developed, etc. And then temples came later. But it's actually the other way around we're discovering that it's, um, t you know, sacred sites where people had encountered something that they then built shrines, and those shrines became places of pilgrimage, which then needed round the clock care. And so farming developed in order to sustain the ritual site and then cities developed, etc. So temples are these sort of guest house for spirits, for those who wanted to eat with them. And you would offer a lamb and the spirits would get the blood and the fat as their portion, and it would be burnt up. And then you would eat the meat uh, in the temple in the presence as having a sharing in the meal. And this is true for Israelite religion, just as it's true for pagan religion. So in Ezekiel 44, Six and seven says this, say to the rebellious of the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, enough of all your abominable practices of house of Israel. When you bring foreigners, those uncircumcised in heart, in flesh into my sanctuary, you desecrate it, even my house. When you offer my food, the fat and the blood, you've broken my covenant by your abominable practices. So here God describes blood and fat as his food and that's not because God's hungry at all because he's a spirit uh, but rather that that's what sacrifices are their their food their fellowship their um their hospitality they're coming together okay so their fellowship and communion and that's why the apostles told believers and Christians not to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols because they don't want Christians fellowshipping with demons so back to Acts. Here we see Paul and Silas and they're in prison. In Acts 16, 25 to 31, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the rest of the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly a great earthquake appeared, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors flew open, the bonds of all the prisoners came loose. And when the jailer awoke and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he assumed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out loudly, do not harm yourself, we're all here, and calling for lights. The jailer rushed in and fell down, trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas. And when he brought them outside and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And when they spoke the word of the Lord to him, along with those who were in the house. Friends, this is a... Uh, a passage that praises the way to victory. Paul and Silas are in prison of all places. They've just been beaten. Their, their feet are in the stocks on the floor. They're bruised. They're battered. They're bloody. And yet, how do they react? They're told, we're told they're praying and singing hymns to God and the rest of the prisoners are listening to them. And this is the attitude when a curveball comes our way. Uh, it's a witness to those around us how we react. When life is bitter and we, we're given lemons, do we make lemonade? All of us have choices every day how we react to the events that come to us. We cannot change the events. They're external to us, but we can change our attitude towards those events. And that's sometimes the only thing we can do. Job says in Job 1.21, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will return. There. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. Praise is power. When we stop looking at our situation and look upwards and outwards to God, things do change, even if it's just us that changes. The bitterness, the shame, the anger, the sadness, these things uh, can lift as we lift up our minds and our hearts to God. We might not have all the answers, but a lack of answers does not mean that there should be a lack of praise. For Paul and Silas, Prison wasn't a place of abandonment, but of empowerment, as the Spirit came and brought transformation for them in that dark place. And friends, you might be feeling trapped. You might be feeling imprisoned or abandoned. You might feel locked away and you can't see a way out of the situation. You might not be able to change your situation at all, but you can change your view of the situation. And friends, often the obstacle is the way forward. 
is the the things that test us are the things that make us and in all the great stories and films the hero often fails dies or loses hope just before their ultimate victory and for all of us the tomb is the womb to new life and this is true of our dark moments that they become moments of transformation within our own lives and we're told of Paul and Cyrus, Silas are there praying and singing hymns to God and the rest of the prisoners were listening to them. And when dark times do come, do we go to YouTube or Spotify and start praying and singing or do we look at our surroundings? Do we only see the dark room film filled with chains, our own prisons? The attitude of Paul and Silas led to a salvation moment for those around them and the life of the jailer and his whole family turned to Jesus. And following this event, they, they travelled through uh, Thessal Thessalonica and the Berea again, stirring up trouble. Eventually they arrive in Athens and Luke tells us that Paul is deeply upset by all the idolatry in the city. And that Paul spends his time trying to convince the Jews and the God-fearers that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, and chatting with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And I don't have time now to go into differences, uh, but simple terms, Epicureans and materialists, the world is just made up of atoms. If God exists, they don't answer prayers. They don't do anything. What matters is becoming happy in this life because there's nothing after death. Stoics, on the other hand, believe that the world is ordered according to the Logos, the rational principle behind the universe. And what matters is living virtue, and living a moral life in harmony with the Logos. And so for Paul, when he addresses the philosophers, he speaks of an unknown God who made the heavens and the earth, who calls all people to repent, particularly of their idolatry. He wants them to serve no longer the demonic spirits who they worship. Um, and that he will one day, that's God, will one day judge the world, putting all wrongs right through Jesus, this man, and he's, who's, he's risen from the dead. And so to make Paul's point, he quotes from their own philosophers, from their own writings. And Paul's first quote comes from the Critia, the pre-Socratic philosopher poet Epimenides. And it forms part of this verse. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. But you are not dead. You live and abide forever. For in you we live and move or have our being. And that's the line that Paul quotes. And the second quote is from the Panomelia of the uh, philosopher poet Eratus, a student of Zeno, the very founder of Stoicism. And he says this, let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of Zeus. Even the sea and the harbour are full of his deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are indeed his offspring. And Paul quotes that line, we are indeed his offspring. And Paul quotes these poems and he says, as your philosophers say, about Zeus and applies it to the God of Israel. And Paul's not saying Zeus is the God of Israel because he's he's not doing that. He's a devout Jew. Rather, he's saying that these writings do contain truth, but you're in error because Zeus isn't the one in whom we live and move our having have our being. It isn't Zeus who's the father of us all. In fact, it's the God of Israel. And for us, it might be shocking that Paul does this, that he's um, we would not dream of quoting pagan poetry and applying it to God. But Paul's using it to correct and attack his opponents. Paul's not a all roads lead to heaven sort of guy, but rather he hates idolatry. He's calling them to repent of their idolatry and come and worship the true and living God. He knows Zeus is just a demonic spirit, and yet Paul appeals to common grace, that all humans are made in God's image. And if even if that image is broken, pagans might be wrong about the spirits that they worship, but it doesn't mean that everything they've ever written is wrong. There's natural revelation. And Paul writes in Romans 1, uh, 19 to 23, says, because what can be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they're understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. But they became futile in their thoughts and in their senseless hearts were darkened. Though they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for an image resembling hum mortal human beings or birds or full-footed animals or reptiles. 
So for Paul, no one has an excuse for not knowing about God, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature are clearly seen. What Paul objects is people taking these lesser created beings and then substituting them for the immortal, glorious God. And he uses pagan literature to tell the pagans, you're worshipping the wrong God. They need to turn away from their demons to the living God. And there's a simple lesson for us here, and that's use things people know about to talk and share Jesus with them. If people like sports, then share Jesus using sports. If people like films, use films to share about Jesus. It's whatever means you can to tell people about Jesus, whatever means, because Jesus is the key. He's the irresistible one. If people hear about him, they're going to fall in love. So after Athens, they head to Corinth, to uh, Ephesus, and then to Jerusalem, back to Antioch. And in conclusion, friends, um, what are our personal mission strategies? Each of us has a choice and each of us know every day how we're going to react to the events that come to us. We cannot change the events. They're external to us. But what we can change is our attitude towards those events. And often the obstacle is the way. It's the best. Uh, it's the thing is, is it's the test that shows us who we really are. And as we press forward, as we press out, are we called to use whatever we can in order to tell people about Jesus Christ? Because he's the one that matters and he's the one who brings change. Heavenly Father, we just pray that this uh, message will be a blessing to people as they seek to go out into the world and be a blessing to the people that they come into contact with. Amen. Amen.